Well, about, uh, I, I guess ever since the, the book Casino came out, you know, um, I was part of a team uh, with the Kansas City Police Intelligence Unit. Several of us were assigned to work as part of a task force or a team with the FBI because we had a whole lot of, of murders in Kansas City and as part of this Spiro Savella war. And we had some, uh, some other murders, and organized crime murders. It was kind of the last organized crime murders we had in Kansas City. I think we've had two since this uh, middle, middle to late 70s. And we were out doing surveillances and, and the FBI started this one, actually it was a hidden microphone. It's the same one that uh, you've seen the movie Casino where you, you see the hidden microphone in the little corner store up in the uh, heat vent, up, up in the uh, heating uh, air conditioner or whatever it is vent. And the guy who's playing Tuffy Looney, I think it's Remo Gaggi or something like that, Remo Gaggi or I get those names mixed up. Anyhow, the guy's playing Tuffy Looney has complained about having to go to Las Vegas. Well, in Kansas City, we had a place, a joint called the Bill of Capri, and they'd put in a, in order to find out about these murders, and there was more murders of the Spiro brothers planned, and, and I think one other person uh, from in, in bureaus that had informants that said they were still planning murders, and they had informants that said they were doing it at one particular table at this Villa Capri restaurant. Well, that was that was the same one that was in Casino, and what they heard, it's just like Casino was, Tuffy DeLuna talking to Cork Savella about mob stuff, but it wasn't about murders. They never heard any information about local murders there, but they did hear about the Teamsters. They heard about Las Vegas. They heard about millions of dollars. They heard about a guy named called Genius, who they learned later was a man named Alan Glick, who had gotten a $62 million loan from the Argent, or the Teamsters for his corporation called the Argent, and used that to buy the Stardust, the Tropicana, the Marina, and the Fremont, or was it the Frontier? Uh -oh. <laughs> Anyhow, four casinos. Uh, for sure, he had the Stardust because that was the flagship. That's where most of most of the skim came from. Was out of the Stardust, and, and so they the Teamsters loaned him that money only because the four Midwest mob families had put pressure on their Teamsters contacts to loan him that money, and then he was instructed to put Lefty Rosenthal or the Robert De Niro character in as an important and a key employee, an important enough employee who then turned around and hired other people who set up a steady stream of skim money as much as 100000 or more a month coming out of that back to Chicago, and they had to share it with Milwaukee and Cleveland and Kansas City. So they hear Cork Savella and our underboss, Tuffy Luna, talking about the Stardust and Lefty and money and so they continued to listen, and, and one night they said, well, you need to get a phone. And, and, and then they got on another telephone at the Breckenridge Inn, which was a hotel, a bank of pay phones. And they start listening there, and, they're, and all the talk is about Las Vegas. They're, they have this, uh, find out Tuffy Luna's undercover mole it was at working at the Tropicana, and he was working for Tuffy and Nick Savella at the Tropicana. Uh, and he had his own set, a separate set of a stream of skim coming out of the Tropicana, and then we find, then they find out from these wiretaps and some other bugs that it ended up with like 19 wiretaps going at one time, just in Kansas City. Plus, there was wires in Las Vegas and and Chicago and Milwaukee and Cleveland, and uh, it was uh, it was unbelievable the how amount of information was brought in via wiretaps and. and and so Nicholas Pelleggi spends several days in Kansas City with Bill Owsley, and he gives him all kinds of help. And he continue, he's a great writer. He really is. Uh, uh, and he writes a book and writes a screenplay for Casino. And so in Casino, uh, and especially the movie, they mainly deal with Jerry and Nick. I mean, and, and uh, uh, Jerry and uh, Lefty Rosenthal and that relationship, and Tony Spilatro and. And they, don't, they talk a little bit about Kansas City, but not very much. As a matter of fact, I got my name in the book. Uh, a, a policeman, I ran, I ran into a policeman walking down the street, and he said, hey, he said, I just read your name in a book. I said, what do you mean my name in a book? He said, there's a book. It's called Casino. It's over there at Barnes & Noble. And he said, uh, go over there and look. Uh, and so I go over and I find Nicholas Pledge's book, and there I am because I was one of the team that went into Tuffany Luna's house to serve search warrants on him. So, you know, we now know that 
as a result of that investigation, they indicted and put into jail for mainly the rest of their lives the mob bosses, Tuffy DeLuna and Nick Savelle in Kansas City, and the Joey Iupa and Jackie Cerrone and Angela LaPrietra in Chicago, and Joy Lombardo in Chicago, and, and uh, Frank Ballesteri in Milwaukee, the mob boss there, and, uh, and Milton Rockman in Cleveland. They would put uh, Angelo Leonardo, who was a mob boss of Cleveland, but he was in jail for another thing at the time and ended up actually testifying against these other mob bosses during those uh, skim trials. So, you know, Bill and I and some of these other guys meet periodically. We meet about every quarter for lunch. Uh, everybody that used to work these kinds of intelligence unit, professional criminal, mafia cases, FBI and Kansas City Police and some other, Johnson County, uh, which is a suburban county. So we had some contacts out there, and we had people out there that worked with us. It was kind of this elite group of people that worked these cases that all know each other. We meet for lunch periodically, and Bill and I, and some of the Larry Wisher and Bobby and some of those guys, we were talking about how this movie and this book kind of, you know, focused on the soap opera with Lefty Rosenthal and Jerry and you know, Petchy or whatever, you know, he, that's really supposed to be Tony Spilatro. And, who, you know, Tony Spilatro was out there, but he had his gang, his own gang going there out doing burglaries, and, and he didn't really have much to do with the skim uh, because it was Kansas City that was controlling everything about the skim. We know that now because the Alec Glick, when they wanted him to sell the Tropicana and the Stardust and the Fremont and the, I mean, uh, the Frontier and the uh, uh, Marina, they sent Tuffy DeLuna out. They didn't send Tony Spilatro over to tell him that. They had Tuffy DeLuna fly out. And and, and so we want to tell this story and, and uh, from our standpoint. So I decide I want to do a documentary about it. And I talked to Bill Owsley and some other agents that were involved. And I said, well, we need to get those wiretaps to have some of those wiretaps at least to have some sound bites from that because that would be really powerful. We can have, we can sit there and talk about it till we're blue in the face, but it's still a bunch of policemen talking about it. I got to find those wiretaps and put that audio in there. So we ask around and, and we actually have a, a, somebody who still works there in the organized crime unit and uh, she goes down into the archives and checks and yeah, the, the case files are all down there at the Kansas City office. And, I'm a lawyer by now. I've retired and I've become a, a, a lawyer. I figure out, I go research the law. If you, It's under Title III of the um, uh, Omnibus, Omnibus Crime Control Act of 1968, Title III, that created the wiretap statutes. Before that, there were no wiretap statutes. If you did it, it was, it was not covered by law, shall we say. <laughs> uh, and so what you have to do, I had to file a motion with the Western District of the United States a court, District Court in the Western District of Missouri to ask for those wire, all that evidence that was gathered under Title III to be released. And as long as it was for historical purposes and not used to be uh, embarrassed or uh, hurt anybody or gain financial, uh, was it some other, gain, e uh, get, obtain economic gain, I think is one of those things. Can't use it for it. So I thought, well, everybody's dead pretty much. And, and so I want to get those. And I've, cre I've composed a motion. Uh, we filed at the Western District Court and, and they approved it and took it over to the FBI. And one day myself and Bill Owsley and, and the former supervisor of the Organized Crime Squad Gary Hart, we all go over there and they get the wiretaps and, and, and of course they're real helpful and they give us a tape because they're all cassette tapes. These are dupes of dupes of the originals and, and because they only, they had thousands and thousands and thousands, and there was, there was 4,000 hours I think of tapes that were actually put into evidence but they had uh, 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 100,000 hours of tape, of just reel to reel tape. And then those had been clipped out just as exhibits because you could only obtain the wiretap evidence that had been put in evidence as exhibits uh, in, in front of a court. You can't get the raw stuff. So they had them all into cassette tapes, and some of them were a little bit bad, and some of them were pretty good, and you know they're all over the, as far as sound quality. But I got all those tapes that they had put in as evidence, and we duped them off that day, and then I took them home and then had to digitalize them. 
And I use that as the, you know, a lot of the movie, when I tell about that, I, then I'll click to, you know, and when, uh, when I'm talking about the intercept at the Villa Capri, that uh, Tuffy makes a statement that uh, I, uh, I told him, I said, boy, you got to make a public announcement or whatever you got to do and get out of there. He said, I put that in his head. And that's something they heard. And then and he was talking about genius. And, you know, they check out in Las Vegas and they find out genius is Alan Glick. They got informants out there that know that the mob guys call him, a lot of people call him genius. And the mob guys all call him genius. And that genius has just offered up for sale the Stardust, as well as his other casinos. And it's like, oh, man. And he made a public announcement like, oh, this is good. And it kind of takes off from there. And, and so uh, we want to tell that story of, of Kansas City and, and their connection to, to investigating into the skim and really, you know, obtaining a successful con conclusion of a prosecution. Now, they didn't do it all alone, of course, but, but uh, they were the primary agency and all the trials were in Kansas City that prosecuted all these Midwest mob families for skimming from Las Vegas and, and effectively stopped the skim. Las Vegas has never been the same since. No, the Midwest mobs are never able to get a foothold back into Las Vegas because Boyd gaming, gaming came in and took over and, and the big time corporations that were publicly traded stocks came in and they could never get back in again. But that, you ruined Las Vegas we, for the rest of us. Well, I've heard many people say that they ruined Las Vegas and they like Las Vegas the way it used to be. I don't know. <laughs> I can see all the hate comments already. We ruined Las Vegas. Oh yeah, I've, I've already heard that a lot. <laughs>